Hello and welcome to Edison TV. Today I'm joined by Jamie Brodsky and Christopher Abbott, who are co-heads of Riverstone Credit Partners, the investment manager of Riverstone Credit Opportunities Income. The fund invests in a diversified portfolio of senior loans to mid-market entities, mostly engaged in building the infrastructure and providing infrastructure services to generate transport, store and distribute both renewable and conventional sources of energy, as well as those focused on the transformation of the global energy sector from fossil based to zero carbon. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Great to, great to be here. Now, you recently completed your portfolio transition to green and sustainability linked loans. So maybe you can talk us through how these are structured and how they contribute to the global decarbonization trend. Sure. Um, well, listen, as you mentioned, we've been transitioning our portfolio. And um, when we started, uh, we really, first of all, wanted to uh, make sure that we were uh, not abandoning uh, the energy sector and, and sort of rushing off to do, you know, new technologies or things that were maybe unproven, uncreditworthy. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to to make sure that our capital was going to work in a way that would uh, drive behavior and drive decarbonization in in the industry. Um, and you know, we we sort of uh, were thinking about how to do that, and and sort of saw these two structures, the green loan and the sustainability linked loan structures being used in the syndicated bank market, in the leveraged loan market, in the syndicated bond market, um, and really started to learn more about those structures to see if they'd be applicable for us. Um, the LSTA, the Loan Syndications and Trading Association, which is sort of a self-governing body here in the US, puts out a, a sort of guidelines and, and sort of key principles that you have to adhere to in order to make these loans. Uh, and we worked uh, with those guidelines and some of our advisors to make sure that this was something that we thought we were confidently able to apply for every loan that we make. So beginning um, about 18 months ago, uh, we made the decision that every new loan that we would make would be either a green loan or a sustainability linked loan. Um, essentially when an opportunity comes in, um, it, it uh, is screened by the team, but we make that decision whether it's gonna be a green loan or a sustainability linked loan. And um, green is pretty simple. Um, it has to have a use of proceeds of the loan that is tied to a uh, a green activity, uh, which is really defined as something that advances one of the UN sustainability development goals. Um, it's very, very strict though. So every dollar has to go towards that objective. So you can't do things like refinance old debt or um, pay uh, interest expense, things like that going forward. So it is very, very strict. And we've had some deals that you think would be easily green that aren't uh, because of the way that the definition works. Um, thankfully, though, the sustainability linked loan is simpler. It can be made to any company that has sustainability goals uh, that are set by the board and that can be audited and measured um, going forward. Um, and this allows us to really apply um, this technology or this application to pretty much any type of company that we, that is in the sector. Uh, but it has to have you know those those uh, sustainability development goals or sustainability goals rather that we can uh, we can dig into. Um, people say, well, how do you how do you know that every company that you want to lend to is going to have those goals? Um, and we we say it's a it's a very good question and it's a fair one, um, but it actually is a great due diligence checklist item for us because if you think about it, any company that's engaged in the energy business that doesn't have sustainability goals uh, probably doesn't have strong governance. Um, we we find that. Uh, well-governed companies, companies with functioning boards that have constituents, you know, obviously their shareholders, but also their employees, their uh, communities that they work in, et cetera. Well-governed companies always are trying to get better and trying to do better. And therefore we found that it's quite simple to, um, to, to look at these sustainability goals and then, um, you know, make sure that they can be measured and audited. Uh, but then it's very simple to tie them into our loan documentation in order to meet the uh, the uh, SLL uh, principles as set up by the LSTA. So in any event, um, it has it has been a great tool for us uh, to put into our deals and to make sure that um, each of the companies that we work with is either directly uh, supporting uh, a green initiative 
um, with our proceeds, but it, or if they're not, that we are holding them accountable to their own objectives um, in terms of meeting those sustainability goals. And, and those are typically tied to specific decarbonization objectives that they're trying to achieve within their own company. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of structure, but again, being credit guys, and we're not the ones sitting on these boards dictating what management can and can't do. We think it with the credit structure, this is the best way for us to make sure our capital is going to decarbonize the energy business. Thank you, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just add one more thing to that, which is this is these are the positive um, benefits of of a lot of what's you know happened in and around the ESG dialogue, right? You know, at the end of the day, we're not doing much different than we you know got in business to do, um, but we are holding ourselves and our borrowers to to a higher standard, um, and so I think the pivot on balance is not only you know sort of welcomed um, by us, but the borrowers really appreciate it. It helps them um, streamline their businesses. It helps them refinance us when the time comes because they've been able to sort of put um, the dialogue around how they are working to improve, make the, you know, make their business more sustainable, um, what have you. So it's definitely been a benefit. Thank you. That's definitely very helpful. Now, obviously, the recent interest rate hikes, um, well, have given you a uh, quite significant tailwind in terms of income generation. At the same time, normally higher rates will trigger higher default rate across the economy. So uh, maybe you can discuss how these two factors influence your current portfolio, uh, given your focus on the energy sector. Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely... Um, an interesting phenomenon, right? We, we've, um, you know, we've set up our lending product to be able to, so, you know, s sustain and to be able to go through all kinds of different market environments. Um, you know, that includes a rate, uh, a rate increasing environment. Now we haven't seen that in a long time. Um, from our standpoint, we've always been uh, a floating rate product. We've tried to take interest rate exposure, at least from our side, um, out of the equation. Um, but the question, you know, really, you know, it, it, it asks what happens to the borrower, right? Because, you know, the burden now falls onto the borrower because their overall, their increased cost of capital um, could ultimately um, hinder, you know, hinder their ability to, you know, service the debt um, and cause issues. Um, we will say that, you know, rate, uh, rate increasing environment almost by definition means that, you know, the economy is performing. Um, and these companies should be performing. So on balance, they should be able to support this um, increased cost, um, but it's something we're very mindful of. You know, there is always a natural ceiling what we can charge companies. Um, you know, if you're lending to well-sponsored companies that have equity, um, if our cost of debt starts to really eat into their equity returns, uh, they may just decide not to not to um, take your money and and over equitize something, and so you know as the cost of capital gets more and more expensive, we also need to be mindful of what the equity returns are and what the equity is looking for, and and, and as those sort of encroach uh, on each other, um, it may force uh, you know a different dialogue as we're entering to new deals. Say so the other um, you know the thing we're mindful of is. You know, th these companies don't necessarily spring up overnight, right? They're a series of projects that are underwritten in various different market environments. And so a project that was underwritten uh, a year and a half ago in a completely different rate environment um, may not work in the current uh, in the in, in the current context, right? Because the cost of capital has increased. Uh, maybe the cost of you know labor has gone up. Um, you know what have you. So all of these things factor. Uh, into, you know, the energy business or even industrial businesses. And um, we have to look at it on a case-by-case -case business, a uh, case-by-case basis and a case-by-case -case business um, and make those decisions, uh, make those decisions accordingly. Today, you know, RCOI itself is, a, is largely fully deployed, 100% um, floating rate. So we're, we're certainly seeing the benefit of the, of the increased rate environment. Um, but we are certainly cognizant of the fact that that burden does fall on these companies and these companies need to be able to, to service our debt. That being said, um, feel really good about the health of the, uh, of the portfolio where it stands today. Thank you. And now with the recent deterioration in the availability of financing from banks, uh, do you as a direct lender see pickup in, in your investment pipeline? So 
uh, interestingly, our, our business model going back almost a decade was um, that banks didn't like lending to the energy sector. So, um, you know, or, or, or lent within a very formulaic model. Um, and we look to break that mold um, and bring a different mindset with how um, we provided capital to, to energy companies. Um, that obviously um, hasn't gotten any better from a banking perspective with the fallout of SVB um, and the subsequent pressure on um, local and community banks who typically have been good supporters to the energy industry um, that should uh, in fact lead to more opportunities for us. But we've always operated with, with little uh, in the way of competition. Uh, our product is very bespoke. Um, it's very, uh, company specific, it's project specific, and there's just not a lot of capital out there looking to do what we do. So on balance, I do believe it's helpful for us, less competition. Although as a lender, you're always mindful of how do you get your money back? And a healthy financing market um, is a way to get your money back, right? Uh, and, and in many situations, we look at it as at, at, at an exit as we're basically helping companies bridge themselves to a cheaper cost of capital, which should be those banks. So if those banks aren't there, we need to be mindful and cognizant uh, how else they may ultimately refinance us. Thank you. And finally, can you maybe elaborate on, uh, well, your current dividend policy and what investors should expect in, in, in terms of payouts in the near term? Sure. Um, we paid out nine cents last year. Um, eight cents in regular dividends, so two cents a quarter, uh, and then one cent in a special dividend uh, based on the, the earnings of the portfolio, um, which accelerated through the year. Um, right now, uh, our policy is to, is to pay out substantially all the earnings um, of the trust. Uh, we are still confident in our eight to 10 cents per annum uh, forecast, uh, which we've been sticking to really since inception. Um, I think uh, we've just announced a two cent distribution um, for the first quarter uh, that'll be going out shortly. And, um, uh, you know, we think we'll, we'll probably follow the same mold we did last year, which is trying to keep uh, the distributions relatively stable um, with the potential for a special distribution, you know, to the extent we have any windfalls from a, a big win or, or disposition uh, in the portfolio. Um, some of our shareholders uh, have sort of indicated that you know, retaining some of the earnings uh, for NAV growth would be appreciated. Uh, so we look at that uh, you know, every year. Last year, as I said, we paid out nine cents, but we did retain uh, about eight tenths of a cent for NAV growth. Um, and that was reinvested into the portfolio. Um, you know, that we have to obviously pay out 85% to maintain our trust status. Um, so somewhere between 85 and 100% will be paid out with the rest retained um, to, to grow the portfolio. But all of that in the context of that eight to 10 cents, uh, we, we feel very good about. So, um, uh, you know, no reason to expect that to uh, have any issues uh, this year. And uh, with rates being higher um, and the portfolio fully deployed, there's, a, there's you know, uh, we, we'd expect it to be, you know, on the upper end of that, uh, most likely. Jamie Broski and Christopher Abbott. Riverstone Credit Partners, thank you very much for your time.